hand. Well, good morning. It is, uh, it's good to be together. We are continuing our series titled Follow, and we're continuing through the Gospel of Matthew, and today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9, so if you have your copy of God's Word, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and turn or turn on your copy of Matthew chapter 9, and that's what we'll be looking at this morning. But again, this is the series is called Follow, because we're looking at who invites us into following after him. Of course, that's Jesus invites us into following him, and, and really looking what that means to be a follower of Christ, to be a Christian, to be a disciple. And as we're looking, and, and what we're seeing is that God doesn't allow much room for interpretation of what he expects from those who follow after him. And today we're going to see just how amazing our God is once again. And as followers, what that looks like practically lived out. But as we get started, just to, to kind of set the, our mindset this morning on, on this Jesus and what we've done for the past several weeks is we start off with looking at the deity of Jesus. That Jesus was both fully God and fully man. And he had this interaction with a man named Thomas in John chapter 20. And see, after the resurrection of Jesus, many of his followers, disciples, saw him, but Thomas did not. And so when it was reported to Thomas, he said, I'll believe it when I see it. Does anyone have that same heart sometimes? I'll believe it when I see it. And poor Thomas, he gets a bad rap because all these years later, we know him as Doubting Thomas. I mean, that's, that's a pretty harsh title that he's carried all these years, but it, nonetheless, I'll believe it when I see it. A short time later, Jesus comes into a meeting with all of his disciples, and he points out Thomas specifically. He says, Thomas, come on over. Touch my hands. Touch my side. He says, turn your faithlessness into believing. And Thomas's response in John 20, 28 says, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus' response he says, you believe because you see. Blessed are those who believe that have not seen. And those, we're included in the those as followers of Christ. Blessed are those who believe yet have not seen. And so that sets the stage on this Jesus that we follow is both fully God and fully man. And that is a sound doctrine that we can bank on. And that's some of what we're going to talk about this morning is sound doctrine. But before we get there, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. And Jesus has a following up to this point. Large crowds start following him wherever he goes because he's basically the David Blaine of his time, right? He's done all these miracles. He's attracting a following because of the things he's doing and the things he's providing and the way he teaches. He teaches with authority that's never been heard of before and just these things that people are attracted to. And so large crowds follow him. And then we see something very unique that we'll see repeatedly in the life of Jesus. And it's his compassion. And so if you're a note taker, you can title this sermon, Compassion in Action. Compassion in Action. And I think it's helpful if we clarify what we mean by compassion. Because we have compassion in a lot of different ways. And I'll tell you, for an animal lover, there are certain things that stir up my compassion for animals. And I don't know if anybody's seen this commercial. It hasn't been on for quite a while. But the SPCA commercial with Sarah McLaughlin singing. And if it wasn't for my wife holding me back, we'd probably have 75 dogs in the house because it tears me up every time I see it. There's a compassion aspect there. But that's not the compassion that we see that's not a complete picture of the compassion that Jesus has or that we should have as followers of him. Which brings us to Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. It says this, when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. And so it's helpful to understand really words and their meanings. And compassion here really means a deep 
sympathy. Why? He saw the vast crowd, and he saw they were distressed and dejected, meaning they were troubled or in troubled and thrown down. And we're going to get to what that means. But then he makes this statement. They're like sheep. And this terminology is used a lot in the teachings of Jesus. But they were like sheep without a shepherd, and that's key. Because I don't know if you know this, that sheep are not the most aggressive, flesh-eating, ferocious animals on the planet. They're very much prey animals. They don't have a defense mechanism. What it is is that you run. When danger is present, they're not going to fight anyone. They're going to run as best as they can. They're going to run, try and find the rest of their sheep and corral together for self-defense. And in my mind, the wolf has got to be thinking, all right, I, can't, I came from a, got, got a meal. Now, now I got a, a buffet. Like it turned into one platter. Now I got a golden corral style buffet in front of me. Because again, sheep are defenseless creatures. And they often wander without guidance, which brings in, like sheep without a shepherd. Because the shepherd has a distinct responsibility to the sheep. The shepherd cares for the sheep. He guides the sheep. He keeps them safe. He provides for his sheep. And he defends the sheep when necessary. And he provides guidance and direction for the sheep. And for really a complete picture of the good shepherd, the shepherd that Jesus is specifically, Go to Psalm 23 just this week and read through what the good shepherd does for his sheep and how he cares for his sheep. And again, Jesus looked across these crowd, this crowd of people, and saw they were troubled, distressed, dejected. They were a people lost. They were a people hurting. They were a people seeking, searching. And yet they were a people being led astray. And I'm going to keep it very simple because I think you can look at people that are led astray both then and now in two broad categories. One, people are led astray. This is a universal truth because, I mean, we see it today by picking their own way, right? Going their own way, maybe like Fleetwood Mac might say. Following their own heart. Isn't that a saying that we hear over and over? Follow your heart. Your heart will guide you. And it sounds nice, but let me just remind us the encouragement that Scripture gives about our heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. So what are we trusting? Are we trusting our heart really to guide us in all things? Because what we're doing in that circumstance is really making ourselves God. We're all worshiping a God. Just oftentimes, it's ourselves. And to be completely honest, we make a lousy God. We do. We make a lousy God. Other people, if that's your trust and that's what you are putting your bank on, people make a lousy God. Things, houses, money, cars, they make a lousy God. Yet that's what our life is so often devoted to, and that will lead you astray. So that's one aspect of just looking at this crowd that's being led astray, following their own desires, their own way, their own heart, and searching for the next big thing that will satisfy their uncurable appetite. And then there's being led astray by false teaching, by false doctrine, by false teacher. And scriptures have a lot to say about false doctrine, false teachers, that we should listen to. And the same thing that was true then was true before then, and it's true now, that there's plenty of people out there teaching a false doctrine that's going to lead many astray. And so when Jesus sees this, he's having compassion. He's felt compassion. Again, who does he continue to get on for their hypocrisy? It is the religious leaders of the day. He calls them whitewashed tombs, you brood of vipers, hypocrites. But I love this passage out of 2 Timothy chapter 4. The Apostle Paul, in inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this to this young pastor in Ephesus named Timothy. He starts off in verse 2, 
He says, preach the word. And really, you just put a period right there. Preach the word. Stay faithful to the word. And church, if you're visiting here, if you haven't been around here long, this is our heart. We are going to preach the word because that is where the authority lies. That's what God uses to convict and can draw in tandem with his Holy Spirit. Preach the word, and it's not always popular. It's not always easy. Matter of fact, oftentimes it's downright tough. But God's word is authoritative and perfect. And so he says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. Now here's what I want you to focus in on, because we're talking about false doctrine, false teachers, people being led astray. He says in verse 3, for the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. In other words, accurate teaching. But according to their own desires, will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. People were being led astray then, and it's true now. Just this week, I had a conversation with a guy in my office, also known as Panera. It's my office. They have this coffee subscription, which is killer, and free Wi-Fi. So I have an open-door policy if you guys ever want to come up there. But I was talking with this guy, and uh, we just get into a gospel conversation. He really started it. He, uh, he asked me, what happens to you after you die? And to me, I'm like, yeah, this is a, a softball. I'm ready for this. And so I explained to him. I just laid out the gospel. I thought it was pretty clear. And he looked at me. He's like, nope. <laughs> I was like, okay. And so it goes into this conversation. It was a long conversation. I'll spare you all the details. I'd love to share afterwards. But it was really interesting. We had the same Bible. And he came away from it with a totally different understanding. And the crux of it was Jesus was not God at all. He was not Savior for everyone. Matter of fact, he only saved those who were a true Israelite. In his, in his understanding, the true Israelites were not Jewish. They were a certain race. And as he continues to proof text out of Scripture, it was just wildly out of context. And I kept telling him, that's, that's not right. That's an error. That's out of context. That's hypocrisy. But it was scary to me. So at, the point, at that point, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I hope this guy isn't spreading these lies to people leading them astray. So at one point, I was, I felt a zeal, right? The holy just anger that, how are you led astray like this? But quickly, that turns to compassion, thinking, how have you been led astray? The Word of God, and it's so easy. And so when you see people that are led astray, I pray that it breaks our hearts like it did Jesus as he looks across this crowd and just has compassion because they are like sheep without a shepherd. And so again, compassion and action. Compassion drives action. So let me ask you, do you feel compassion or deep sympathy for those who are lost and have been led astray? Just look at the news right now. Look at Portland, Kenosha, Richmond. There are people hurting. Are we mad about it? Or do we see a people who are searching for healing, hope, love, understanding, compassion? Does it drive us to pray? Does it remind us who our hope is in? Is it in ourselves? Is it in others? Is it in politics? Because this may be news to you, but November 3rd isn't going to save our country. Let me go. Neither Trump or Biden are going to be the saviors of this country. So can we please stop acting like they are? And I'm going to say that to our, our own local church, because I see the conversations that are happening in the Big C Church, but I pray for our local church that we could have grace, understanding, 
wisdom, discernment when both talking to each other and have compassion when we see a country that have put all their hope in a governmental leadership who, by the way, that Jesus is sovereign over it all anyway. So not to get too political, but I think it's okay because the Bible demands it at times that our hope is not in our leaders. It is in Christ alone. And this changes everything because God is a God of great compassion. Isaiah 49, 13 says, Shout for joy, you heavens. Earth rejoice. Mountains break into joyful shouts. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. Psalm 116, 5. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is compassionate. Psalm 145, 8. The Lord is gracious and and compassionate, slow to anger, and great in faithful love. This is good news. We serve a compassionate God, and that compassion you see played out in action. God's compassion leads to action. And so I want you to hold your place in Matthew 9, because we're going to come back there in a minute. But I want you to turn to Jonah. And this is one of those awkward moments, because I think we all have like, okay, where's Jonah? And people are looking. I mean, if I don't know where to find Jonah, they're going to, you know, judge me. We have a table of contents. Feel free to use it. It's Old Testament. Go Psalms, Proverbs, get to Joel, Amos, Obadiah. You'll find Jonah. If you go to Micah, you've gone too far. Help each other out. But we're going to take a real quick look at Jonah because when you think of Jonah, any of those that have been raised in church or around church for any period of time, you think of the account of the big fish. Right? That's what sticks out in Jonah. And I'm here to say that should not be what sticks out in Jonah. And that's what we're going to look at. And just to clarify, the big fish, has anybody ever watched river monsters? River monsters. I mean, they have some big catfish that have been known to swallow people. Come on, that's modern day. You know, people try to, you know, say sperm whales could have done it and these different things. And sure, we know what happened. But let's not drift away from that being our sole focus of Jonah. Because I want you to see that God's compassion leads to great action. Compassion in action. Jonah 1, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to, the, to Jonah, the son of Amittai. It says, Get up and go. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come up before me, in some context, Nineveh was evil, notoriously evil, notoriously cruel in their treatment of others, torture, any kind of evil that you could imagine was in Nineveh. It was a dangerous place. The capital of Assyria. And God's calling Jonah to go and preach against it, saying God's wrath is coming on this place because of your wickedness. And Jonah, being the great man of God that he is, did not say, sign me up and send me. Instead, he turned and went the opposite direction as far as he possibly could, jumped on a boat, headed to Tarshish. Completely opposite direction. And it says this, and this harkens back to what we talked about last week. God caused a big storm to come against this ship. So bad, in fact, that everyone in that crew thought they were going to sink. They started throwing things overboard, and Jonah's taking a nap. He's careless in the bottom. And so they come down and say, get up. Help us. Do your share. And so they're throwing stuff overboard, and they're saying, everyone, call out to your God. Whatever God that is, call out to him. And then they do this. They cast lots to figure out this is somebody's problem. Somebody's God is making this happen. Who is it? cast lots and a lot falls on Jonah and Jonah's like fine it was me I'm running from God my bad but Jonah gives a lot of credit to God and so he says listen you throw me overboard and this storm will calm you know it's interesting because at that moment the crew didn't automatically do it they're like no we're not going to do that and I think really out of fear from a God they continue to try and throw things over. It didn't help. The storm's still coming. That sh- the ship is still about to sink. And finally, like, all right, Jonah, if you say so. And they threw him over. 
as they were throwing over, they were saying, God, do not hold us against us. Please do not condemn us for what we're doing right now. And they tossed Jonah into the sea. And at that, that moment, the sea and the storm completely calmed. And then the crew, they worshiped God. So it's amazing how that God can use our disobedience in a way that still brings him glory and brings other people to himself, but it sure wasn't pleasant for Jonah. Because then, as we remember, he was then swallowed by a great fish. But what's telling in Jonah chapter 2, while in the belly of this fish, Jonah says this in verse 1. It says, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. I called to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. I called to him in my distress, and he answered me. And then chapter 2 goes into this prayer that Jonah has. And God heard him and caused this fish to then spit up Jonah. And then I resonate a lot with chapter 3, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Anyone here need to be told twice sometimes? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So the second time, God says, get up. Go to the great city of Nineveh, smelling like fish guts and all. It's not in there. I just made that up. And preach the message that I tell you. Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. I don't know about you. I resonate because I can be a little stubborn at times. But this is what's just absolutely amazing, that God already was working before Jonah even got there. Because then we come to verse 5, and you see the response. Because Jonah goes in and preaches against the city. says, you're evil, and God's judgment is coming. And in verse 5 of Jonah 3, it says, And the people of Nineveh believed God. Then they proclaimed a fast, dressed in sackcloth, from the greatest to the least. And in verse 10, it says, God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil ways. This is what repentance is. You see and been confronted with your sin, and you turn, realizing it's wrong, and you follow after God, rejecting the sin that has not brought God glory. I said, God saw their actions that they had turned from the evil ways, so God relented from the disaster he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. Again, I don't want to stray out. We're talking about God's compassion and action. So he calls Jonah because of compassion he has for this wicked, evil city, and he uses Jonah to go. And so Jonah sees God's moving in great ways in this city that looks desperately lost, and you would think Jonah would just praise God and worship for using him in this awesome way. But yet, his response in chapter 4, verse 1, is a little bit different. It says, Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish in the first place. Now get this. Why did he flee? Here he... This is why I fled in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. This is the focus of Jonah, is God's great compassion, grace, and mercy for undeserving people. I hope that sounds familiar. But Jonah's heart wasn't postured right. And there's some history with the Assyrians, right? And so there's some hatred there. And deep down, Jonah didn't want them to be forgiven. They deserve God's wrath. Yet, God had other plans. God's compassion and action does, in fact, involve us. And also, I want to see God's compassion in action every day. I'll often hear these terms of, you know, God come soon. We know that Jesus is going to return. Lord, bring it. We're ready. Take us now. Come back. But 
I want to change our mindset a little bit. Because we know that Jesus is returning. But in 2 Peter 3, it is about the last days, the Lord's day, when he does return. But 2 Peter 3, verse 9 says this. The Lord does not delay his promise. That means his return, and he is coming back. He doesn't delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but come to repentance. So I want to see every day that goes by, let us rejoice because it's a sign of God's compassion. Because here's the news. When he returns... It's going to change a lot of eternities. It's going to change a lot of people's lives in a blink of an eye. So let us see that every day goes by with him not returning is indeed a facet of his compassion in action. He is waiting, and praise God for the Lord's waiting, because there's plenty of people here and abroad that do not know him yet. His compassion in action, he's waiting, but he's also sending. And that's really what I want to see to spend the rest of his time together this morning is the sending aspect of God's compassion and action. Because go back to Matthew 9. hope you, you had your finger there. In verse 36, we talked about his compassion. But then we come to verse 37. He says this. He said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And listen, I'm not a farmer. I was raised in Southern California. I spent a couple of years in Missouri before I moved to Virginia. Not a farmer, but I know this much. I know they sow, God grows, and there's a time when the crops are ready for harvest to be brought in. And Jesus looks across this crowd and says the harvest is abundant. There's people ready, but there's not enough people that are ready for them being ready. There's not enough people going out. And so he says, pray. Pray that the Lord sends out more people. And the expectation is those that are praying are also going and praying for more to help. And for a parallel passage, you can go to Luke chapter 10. Because it goes through this, but then he sends out. He says, go. He says, go. You're going to be like sheep among wolves. And he sends out 72 of his disciples. Some manuscripts say 70. He says, go, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, and don't take anything in excess, but trust in me, because the harvest is abundant. And what remained true then remains true today. The harvest is abundant. If I'm perfectly honest, church, we're not doing a great job at being the church. God's compassion demands our action, both individually and as a local church. The International Mission Board has some sobering statistics. And so I don't want to bog us down with too many statistics, but I want you to hear and put faces, if you can, to these numbers. Because it's staggering. It's a staggering reality. People groups in the world... There is 11,728 people groups, and still more being discovered. And that may not sound a lot until you break it down into population. That is just under 8 billion, with a B, people in the world that make up these over 11,000 people groups. And as staggering as that is, the unreached people groups is really what should break our hearts. And when I say unreached, it's good to define terms. It's a people group that's less than 2% evangelical. And so unreached people groups, there are 7,069 unreached people groups in the world. This is bad. Understatement of the year. This is bad. That population is just over 4,600,000,000 people in those people groups that are deemed unreached. And then to make it worse, every day, every two seconds, people are dying 
Every day there's 154,937 people that die every day. And this should absolutely crush us. If we have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us, knowing that he is abounding in his compassion, this should break our hearts. Why? Jesus, in John 14, 6, says, I am, which we're going to do a whole I am series at some point. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So when you hear these numbers, this should absolutely break our heart. It should break our heart, but it should also fill us with an urgency for those that don't know Christ. To go, that compassion that leads to action. And I don't share a lot because God is still moving and working in amazing, amazing ways. Again, the International Mission Board, the IMB, shares this. This past year, in 2019, there was 12,368 new churches planted internationally. That's good news. That's God moving in amazing ways. There was 89,325 new believers internationally. Praise the Lord. And currently, the IMB has 3,615 missionaries internationally for the sake of the gospel, for God's glory, in oftentimes very difficult circumstances because they realize that salvation is in Christ alone. And right now, there's a couple hundred missionaries being ready to be sent out internationally. So this is good news, but as we've seen, the harvest is abundant. And this church isn't going to reach it, reach those by ourselves. Again, our heart is to love God, love others, and make disciples. That's a local church, but we do that through cooperating with other local churches for God's glory and to reach the nations. In the state of Virginia, we live in a heavily diverse state. The nations are truly represented here. Go to up to D.C., Woodbridge area. The nations are represented there, but you don't need to go that far. Go to Short Pump. The nations are here. The nations are here. And praise God, in this state, we've planted, as far as our cooperation with the SBC of Virginia, we've planted 16 new churches in the state of Virginia this year. This is good news. Our compassion leads to action. We are a church on mission. We are people called to live on mission. We're commanded to be sent. The church is designed by God to be much more of a battleship than a cruise liner. You understand me? Oftentimes we come to church and like, this is nice. No one here says this because we're in a parking lot. It's hot. <laughs> Amen. But oftentimes we treat church as a luxury cruise liner. And listen, I, I like some nice things. I wouldn't complain about AC right now. I wouldn't do it. But we're a church on mission. God established the church to be a disciple-making and multiplying and sending hub for his glory. So we have a mission. And what I want us to hear is our mission definitely doesn't end here. It does start here because this is where God has established the way church. To reach those that are far from him. But it doesn't end here. Acts 1.8. They were still in Jerusalem before Jesus' ascension. He says, wait. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. What does that mean? Jerusalem was their area. Judea and Samaria was a lot bigger of a region. And then to the ends of the earth. That means you keep going. You keep making disciples. You keep proclaiming the gospel. 
And the church doesn't have missions. It has a mission to make Christ known where he hasn't been known for God's glory. Psalm twenty two twenty seven says, All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before you. What I, I don't want us to miss that the Great Commission is just didn't just come about in the New Testament. Like this making disciples, bringing glory to God, telling other people about this great God isn't just something that's happened since Jesus. Yes, Jesus gave us the Great Commission specifically, but when you go out through the whole Old Testament, God established a people to display his glory to the nations, people, groups. And he always made a way for those to come to him to worship him. So how are we going to reach those who don't know the gospel with the gospel? This is the question we have to understand. And in the negative, it's not through programs. Rather, it's being the church that God meant the church to be. That is living every day in our personal lives on mission for God's glory. And just to restate the church, our church's mission statement, it is meant to be known by us. And so we, we, we simplify it by love God, love others, and make disciples. But in its entirety, it's we exist to love God, love others, and make disciples who go to our neighbors and nations with the gospel of Jesus. That is why we're here. And everything we do is going to be aimed at that. Because there's a people that are desperately lost in that need, that hope and fulfillment and joy and peace that comes from Christ alone. And so when we look up, we need to see the harvest that is abundant. In John 4, 35, Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, don't say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. There's a people ready. If you really do some digging right now, there's some revivals breaking out in Kenosha for the glory of God. People are coming to Christ because there's a readiness. God's going to use disaster for his glory. He's going to use some hard times to bring people to himself to show the compassion and love and grace and mercy that comes in Christ alone. Are we ready and are we being intentional with every day of our lives? We need to open our eyes up because there's a world hurting and in need around us. So how do we apply this? Three simple applications. Pray, give, go. And this is the IMB's emphasis. Pray, give, go. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out more workers into his harvest. And then pray, Lord, where would you have me in this day to go? Who would you have me to tell your good news about? Pray for God to continue to move in amazing ways. You give. We all can go. And we're going to get there in a second. But not all of us can go internationally to those who have never heard the gospel. But are we giving to those ends? Are we using our resources, our finance, to go and send missionaries? I pray that our church is a sending church. I pray God rises up many to be sent out to international countries that don't know the gospel. I pray that God rises up many people to be sent out domestically to plant more churches through the way church. This is why we exist. And then finally, as I said, to go. And yes, that is for some going internationally. God is going to call people to go and serve him in some hard places. But it's going daily. You have a mission field as we leave here. That's why we close every worship as what? Go and be the church and make disciples. This is our mission. If you get, again, I, I, I put some resources on the announcements page. So I hope you can find that under Drive Up Church, go to announcements. There's a, a strategy called Who's Your One? 
It really is. When you, when you see this whole world in the vast hurt and lostness, it becomes overwhelming, and oftentimes that will lead us to do nothing. Where do you start? You start with one. Who's in your life that God's laid in your heart that does not know Jesus? Pray for that one person, and then pray some more, and then pray some more. I love this John Wesley quote. It's so simple. John Wesley, really the founder of the Methodist church because of his methods in making disciples with his society, classes, and bands. And again, the way church, we're not super original, very intentional and simple on purpose. And so we took John Wesley's approach, societies, classes, and bands, and we've implemented it in a way that Replicate Ministries does. Societies is basically this, the local church. Classes, we call community groups. They're open, 10 to 12 people. We come and we meet throughout the week and do life together and study the word together. And then bands is a very small group, three to five people, men with men, women with women. And we dive deeper into accountability and God's word together. All that said, John Wesley, who had an amazing, amazing movement by God, says this. You have one business on earth to save souls. That's it. If we really believe we exist, which we do, for God's glory, God's called us to make his glory known. John Piper said, worship, missions exist because worship doesn't. But one day it will. One day, Jesus says, when the gospel, the good news of the kingdom has been proclaimed to the world as a testimony to the nations, people groups, then the end will come. And in Revelation 7, we see that a people represented from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, is standing before the throne, worshiping him. We have a mission filled, and we're called to it, but not by our own strength. Good, great commission, Jesus says, go because I am sending you and I have all authority. So you go because of who I am, and then trust me to do the rest. So as we close just this time together, I'm going to invite you to respond like I do every week. And that response will look different in each of our lives. How is God calling you to respond to the word this morning? How is God working in you this morning? And maybe most importantly, you have not really, truly known Jesus. You've known about him, but maybe this morning he's calling you to himself in a fresh way. It's finally time for you to commit your life to him. John 10, 10 says, a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give life and give life in abundance. We have abundance in life that comes from Christ. So if that's your response this morning, I encourage you just to pour your heart out to God. He said, I'm a, I'm a sinner. I, I've messed up and I need your salvation. Father, I put my trust in you, Jesus. Maybe you're just recommitting your life to Christ. Listen, we mess up, we fall, we, we fall down, we stumble. But God's saying, you know what? It's time to really get serious. You've known me, but it's time to really devote yourself to me. Maybe that's you. Maybe it's time to identify with Christ by committing yourself to baptism. Maybe you haven't met, taken that step, and God's calling you to identify with him into baptism. Or maybe it's simply, you know what? I have not been living on mission for God's glory. I'm committing myself right now to as you lead me where my feet take me to live intentionally for the God's glory, for the sake of the gospel, and out of a complete abundance of compassion for those around me. I don't know what God's leading you to do, but I ask you just to, as we pray, spend time and respond to him. And then I point back, we have a connect card online. We want to pray for you. We want to walk alongside you because this Christian walk was not meant to do by yourself. We would love to walk alongside you. 
And so however God's leading you, I would ask you just to fill out the connect card and let's pray for you. Let's come alongside you as you grow in Christ. But however God's leading, just respond to him right now. Whether in your living room or you're in this parking lot, pour out your heart before a holy God who has great compassion for you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your patience in my own life. I thank you for your abounding love, your forgiveness, your grace, your mercy, and your amazing compassion, Father. And I ask right now that we just come before you and pour out our hearts and surrender to you, Father, committing our lives and ourselves and all that we are to you, for you are faithful and worthy of all that we are. Lord, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for who you are, Father. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.